So let's look at the following example that deals with applying the Beard Savar law. So suppose we have a very long straight wire, in fact an infinitely long straight wire that runs along the y-axis and which carries an electric current of I that points in a positive direction along the y-axis. So we, here we have our infinitely long straight wire that extends towards negative infinity and towards positive infinity along the y-axis and our electric current I runs in the positive direction along that y-axis. So we essentially want to calculate what the magnetic field B is at a perpendicular distance x from our wire as a result of the electric current that runs in the positive direction along our y-axis. So we want to use the Beaud Savar law to calculate the magnetic field B, a perpendicular distance x from the wire. So let's choose this point to be the midway point between the two sections of our wire. And let's suppose this is our x-axis, this is our y-axis, so that this point is the origin. So the distance from the origin to this point at which we're examining our magnetic field is given by x. So, how exactly are we going to go about in calculating what this magnetic field is as a result of our electric current using the Beaud Savart law? So, let's begin by essentially describing the method that we're going to use to solve this problem. So, we essentially want to divide our wire into infinitely small segments given by dy. Now, each one of these infinitely small segments dy has its own infinitely small electric current known as the current element. So let's pick one of these infinitely small segments shown in the following region. So this is our dy. Now this dy will have an infinitely small quantity of electric current known as the current element. Now by Beat Savart law, this current element will create an infinitely small magnetic field given by dB in this region. Now if we want to find the total magnitude of our magnetic field at this point, we simply have to sum up all of these quantities of dB as a result of all these small current elements found in these infinitely small segments given by dy. So, once again, let's read the following method. We divide the entire wire into infinitely small segments dl that each carry an infinitely small current element. Each one of these current elements will create its own infinitely small magnetic field given by db as per the Beaud Savar law. Now, by right-hand rule number one, each one of these vectors given by db point in the same exact direction. In other words, they point into the board. If we apply right-hand rule number one, we wrap our hand around our wire so that our thumb extends in the same direction as our electric current. And we see that our magnetic field created by our electric current creates concentric circles around our wire and so that at this point our magnetic field happens to go directly into the page as shown by the following X symbol. So that basically implies that to find the total magnetic field we simply add up all our quantities dB as a result of all of these small segments that contain its own current element, its own infinitely small quantity of electric current. So we essentially divide this problem into four steps. So let's begin with step one in which we're applying the Beaud Savart law. So the Beaud Savart law essentially gives us the quantity of magnetic field as a result of a current element found in this infinitely small segment dy. So our infinitely small quantity of magnetic field dB at this point is equal to mu naught multiplied by I divided by 4 pi multiplied by the cross product of dy and r hat 
where dy is this quantity here and r hat is simply our unit vector that points in the same direction as this vector r and which has a magnitude given by 1. Now we divide the cross product by r squared. So I is our electric current, mu naught is simply our constant, it's the permeability of free space, and R is the distance from the point where we're examining our magnetic field to this position where our dy is located. So this is simply one of the dBs, but we want to sum up all of these dBs as a result of all of these infinitely small segments dy that each contain a current element. So, to sum up, we simply take the sum of all these dBs, and that will give us our magnetic field B at this position. Now, another way to represent this is in the following notation using an integral. So, we integrate all the way from negative infinity all the way to positive infinity because this is an infinitely long wire. So we integrate from negative infinity to positive infinity of dB. Now dB is given by the following equation, which is once again the biot savart law. So we replace this quantity with this entire equation, and we take out our constant, which is this ratio. So mu naught i divided by 4 pi, we integrate from negative to positive infinity of the cross product dy and r hat divided by r squared. Now, by definition of the cross product, the, the cross product of any two vectors is equal to the product of the magnitude of those two vectors multiplied by the sine of the angle theta. Now, the angle theta is simply the angle between these two vectors. So our r hat points in the same direction as this vector r, and our dy points in the same direction as this. So that basically means that this is our angle theta. Now, the magnitude of any unit vector is always equal to 1. So the magnitude of this is 1, and that's exactly why that term disappears from this equation. So we replace dy with the vector symbol as simply dy. And this becomes, so this becomes 1 multiplied by 1 multiplied by the sine of the angle theta between our two vectors and we divide by r squared. Now, let's move on to step 2 in which we're essentially going to use the following right triangle. So this is a horizontal line. It has a value of x. That's the base of our triangle. It's the distance from this point to the origin. This distance from the origin to our dy quantity is y and this distance is r. By using the Pythagorean theorem, we know that r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. Now notice in these values, x is always a constant. We assume that x is a constant while y and theta are variables. So because y and theta are both variables and because they appear in the following equation, that basically means in step 3 we must express one in terms of the other. So let's suppose we want to express y in terms of the angle theta. And that we're going to do in the following diagram. Once again, we're going to apply our trig function. So let's use tangent to essentially express y in terms of theta. So, from this triangle, we know that tangent of the angle theta is equal to negative x divided by y. So we have our opposite over adjacent, and the negative sign comes from the fact that this is a negative angle. So tangent theta is equal to negative x divided by y, because this is below our x-axis. If it was above the x-axis, this would be a positive 
positive sign. So now we take this equation, rearrange it, and solve for y. We see that y is equal to negative x, which is a constant, divided by tangent theta. So that basically means we expressed y in terms of our theta. Now, let's express our dy also in terms of our angle theta. So we want to express dy in terms of our theta. So we take this equation and we essentially take the derivative of both sides. So the derivative of our left side with respect to y is simply dy. And the derivative of the right side with respect to the angle theta is equal to positive x d theta divided by the square of sine theta. So, notice that if we once again use the following right triangle, sine theta is simply equal to opposite divided by the hypotenuse. So, opposite is x, hypotenuse is r. So, our sine theta becomes x divided by r. We square that. Now, once we square that, we see that the bottom is x squared, the top is x, so one of these x are canceled, and the r squared goes on top, and we see that dy is equal to r squared d theta divided by x. So, we essentially represented our y in terms of theta and dy in terms of d theta. Now, let's take this equation, let's replace our dy with the following equation, and let's leave our sine theta as it is, and let's leave r squared as it is. So, we get the following result. So, this is step four. Notice the r squares will cancel, and notice the x is a constant, so we can take it outside of our integral, and we get the following result. So, mu naught i divided by 4 pi x, and we integrate from 0 to pi. Now, where exactly did we get the 0, and where exactly did we get our pi? Remember, pi stands for 180 degrees. So, let's look at the following diagram. We know that our lowest point is negative infinity, our highest point is positive infinity. Now, when this bar goes to negative infinity, this angle becomes very small. In fact, it becomes very close to zero. So, at negative infinity, this angle is approximately equal to zero. Now, if we go up all the way to positive infinity, we'll see that it goes up to positive 180, which is equal to pi. So, we're integrating from zero to pi of sine theta d theta. Now, if we integrate this, we get negative cosine theta. So, negative mu naught i cosine theta divided by 4 pi x from zero to pi. So, if we evaluate the integral, we get, well, we have our constant mu naught i divided by 4 pi x multiplied by positive 1, positive 1. So, this gives us 2. The 2 cancels. The bottom becomes a 2, and we're left with the following result. So, the magnetic field uh, next to our long straight wire, a perpendicular distance x from the wire, is given by the following equation, mu naught i divided by 2 pi multiplied by x, which is the same exact equation that we got when we applied Ampere's law.